this time our children's church will dismiss. Take your Bibles with me this morning and let's go over to Psalms 145, please. Psalms 145. One of the words that we're all familiar with is trust. Trust in the counseling world and the physical world is earned. You think about this. You don't just automatically start trusting someone until you know them, amen? We've all been in our years of living been um, I'm trying to use the right well, I'll just use it, swindled once or twice in our life. We've all been taken advantage of once or twice in our life. We've all been hurt by spouses, by family. Trust is very hard to give. We all live in our world today in a guarded life. The more we're hurt, the more we hide our heart. And when you think about it, it's only natural because none of us like the pain of being hurt. And it's those we love the most hurt the most. When someone I don't know, it really doesn't bother me. It's like, but when someone I do know, it hurts more. How do we learn to trust God with our whole heart? Because that carries over in my relationship with God. Because my expectations sometimes are different than God's plans, amen? <laughs> my expectations is this, and when God doesn't do it my way, I tend to get a little bit out of shape. But aren't we all the same? I mean, over the years, I've had to learn to let go. I mean, let go and let God. And that is hard because I have to trust Him that He has my best interests at heart. And there is where it lies today for all of us. Every day is a new day. Every year is a new season. We have, as God told Moses, we haven't been this way before. I, I, don't, I haven't been the rest of 2023 yet, so I can't say, oh yeah, I, I'm, I'm trusting God. Where you go, God, I go. Because I've seen the 2023 December 31st, and yeah, it looks good. So I, I, I'm on board with it. I haven't seen December 31st. I haven't even seen October 31st yet. I haven't even seen August 31st or August 7th, 8th, 9th. You know, you think about this. As you go on, I've seen yesterday, and it went okay. <laughs> but I haven't seen. And when we think about trust, in Psalms 145, David writes a very beautiful psalm in the latter part of his life. David's life had been a myriad of experiences. You think about this. As a young lad, he's anointed to be king. He goes on life as usual. Then all of a sudden, on his journey to his brothers to bring them bread and cheese, he's confronted with another choice. This blaspheming giant that's making fun of God. And Israel's mighty army is doing nothing. And he tells his brothers, is there not a cause? And look, God uses him to slay a giant. Then he had no idea that he's going to be welcomed into the king's household as a son. Well, that didn't last long. He became a son-in-law. I don't know if there's an in-law, outlaw joke here somewhere. He became a son-in-law and he wanted him to die twice. But did he plan that? And then he was hunted by his own father-in-law. Assassins were put at his house. Everything that he had to put his parents for safekeeping in the very nation that he killed their giant. And then, later, later on in the chapter, he pretends, and the Bible says he feigns being crazy. Drools and slobbers and everything else. 
you know how undignified that is? <laughs> to pretend you're, you're, you're a nut job to the king so you can have a safekeeping. And yet you've been anointed king back here. I guarantee you David was going, this is not how I expected it to go. <laughs> This is not how I plan being a king. I'm hunted by the king. I can't even see my wife. Um, you know, I, I'm drooling like, a, like a, somebody that's lost his complete mind and fa uh, facilities of his mind and his body. I'm hiding my parents in the enemy's house because the, their own family's enemy. And everybody I love dies. The priests are killed because of him. And yet, this is what he writes in the latter years of his life in Psalms 145. I will extol thee, my God, O King. I will bless thy name forever. Every day will I bless thee, and I will praise thy name forever and ever. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall praise thy works to another and shall declare thy mighty acts. I will speak of thy glorious honor of thy majesty and of thy wondrous works. And men shall speak of the might of thy terrible acts and I will declare thy greatness. They shall abundantly utter the memory of thy great goodness and shall sing of thy righteousness. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and of great mercy. The Lord is good to all. And his tender mercies are over all his works. All the works shall praise thee, O Lord, and thy saints shall bless thee. They shall speak of the glory of thy kingdom and talk of thy power to make known to the sons of men his mighty acts and the glorious majesty of his kingdom. Thy kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and thy dominion endureth throughout all generations. The Lord upholdeth all that fall and raises up all those that be bowed down. The eyes of all wait upon thee, and thou givest them their meat in due season. Thou openest thy hand and satisfieth the desires of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his way, and holy in all his works. The Lord is nigh unto all them that call upon him, to all that call upon him in truth. He will fulfill the desires of them and fear that fear him. He will also hear their cry and will save them. The Lord preserveth all men that love him, but all the wicked will he destroy. My mouth shall speak of the praise of the Lord, to all, and let all flesh bless his name forever and ever. What a way to end his life. Notice what he says, I will speak of thy glorious honor of thy majesty. I will end of thy works. He's been great to me. He's been good every day. Regardless of what this young lad went through, and as all the years, 40 years as king of Israel, he didn't become king of Israel until 30 years old. So his latter life was in the 70s. But had it been easy? No, Absalom rose up against him. He's had problems. His own general rose up against him. He'd made some bad decisions in counting the people when God says don't. And he had to suffer the loss of many people because of his sin. He suffered the loss of his child because it was conceived in adultery. And the sword never left his house. Yet, unlike Naomi, he says, call me bitter, for God's hand had dealt bitterly with me. David says, every day will I bless thee. I will praise thy name forever and ever. What a difference. Had he sinned? Absolutely. Had he done wrong? Absolutely. But had he done right? Yes, he has. No one's perfect. And yet David says, whatever he's done, the Lord is gracious and full of compassion. What a way as a Christian to look at life. That's because David trusted his God. Even when he was wrong, he knew that God dealt with him justly. Dealing 
with a person like that, we can't afford not to trust Him. The key to any relationship is trust. It is particularly important in a marriage. You've got to trust one another in a relationship, in church, and in animals. If I know my horse trusts me and I trust my horse, I can relax while riding through the forest. If not, I'm in for a ride, and it's not a merry-go-ride. <laughs> and I'm worried about being left in the middle of the woods going, here, horsey, horsey, horsey. <laughs> Wherefore art thou? <laughs> you know, or walking around going, I was watching a cartoon the other day, and it was a guy holding the reins, and he goes, Marco. And the horse is way off and goes, Polo, see you later. <laughs> And I'm like, yep, I've been there one for It's like, yep, never mind. I'm not going to catch that thing. And then when you want him back to the barn, you just want to kill him. <laughs> You're going to go to the glue factory. <laughs> but you know what? You love him enough to work with him, train him. And a lot of things, you don't notice things. The horse hasn't got to trust you. Doesn't know you. And that is the key in a lot of things. Is when someone takes time to know someone. You will, as the Bible says, love cover the multitude of sins. You will understand that I'm not perfect, you're not perfect. But because I love you, we're going to overlook those idiosyncrasies, those faults. And we're going to work together to become better. Our Lord overlooks our faults far more than He should. But what faults does God have? We blame him for a lot of things, but let's be honest. I'm guilty of 99.999% of them, not God. And that 1% is God loves me so much, he's allowing me to go through trials, as he did Job, to make me better. Everything he sent and allowed David to go through, God is the greatest schoolmaster we can ever have. Sometimes we don't, I don't know what to understand what's going on. The older I get, I just want to be settled. I, I, just, I just want to know that my house is going to be there until I die. I, I just want to know everything. We all that. The older we get, just like I talk to my parents, the older we get, what do you need? Nothing. I have all I need. What, what do you, and that's where I am. The older, I just want to be, I, but God says, nope. Journey's not done yet. We've got to have another little turn. Okay, Lord. That's trusting to know that God's got something better. I thought he gave me something great, but God's got something better. What? Lord, um, memo, can you please write in the memo what the better for me so I can be prepared? How to, God's like, nope, not yet. What is it? Faith, trust. And 1 Corinthians talks about charity. Love always trust. Because I loved him, because he first loved me, I will trust that he's got his best interest and my best plan. You know, and this is, as you look at, we all have that moment when we want to understand why we're trusting. But this is where God leads us is faith is going beyond what the eyes can see. I've got to trust his heart when I can't see his hand. And that's the sad thing is sometimes I get ahead of, when I can't see, okay, God's not there. I'll do it myself. That's the big mistake. But this morning as we look at the scripture this morning, we've got a lot of scriptures to go to, but learning to trust God in all circumstances. Let's pray this morning. Heavenly Father, thank you. For all that you've done for us, and Lord, I ask you that you just continue to lead God and direct and help me as I've preached this morning that use the words that you've allowed me to prepare on paper to challenge each and every one of us to trust the Lord in all circumstances. We give you the honor and the glory that with your way, with your path, there is never a wrong turn. And Lord, may we as mankind, as humans, mere mortals with narrow visions, and a heart that tends to focus on unbelief 
more than complete trust. Cleanse us of that thought and implant in us a heart of dependency and trust in the one who loves us so much. Help me as I preach, O oh Lord, in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Everything I've learned about animals and everything I've learned about my horse from Lakota to Jesse to Patchy to Colette to Astrid, all the horses that I've had all my life, each one of them has come with a mixed bag of how someone treated them. Colette, when we got her, she was absolutely wild. She had never been saddled, never been this. Literally on the road down, bringing her home, she's kicking the tail of the trailer as hard as she can do it. And I mean, she just like took us 45 minutes to get her in the trailer, just, and she had that wild eye like, get me on, get on me if you want to. You're going to have a ride of your life. But Lori worked with her. We worked with her. We built that trust. And it was a special bond. There was that gentleness in her eyes where you knew that she wasn't going to do anything silly. Patchy was the same way. The lady sold her just because I don't trust that horse. We had a great trust. But it was earned. It was built. Every horse, every animal, We've all had strays. We've all had adoption animals. They come from a, we don't know what they come from. They just want to be loved. They just want to be bonded with. And when you build that trust, many of you have had rescue dogs that has been with you or rescue cats that has been with you for a lifetime. And they have become a family. And it's when they're gone, there's that void where you go, they go. We had Rottweilers. And they are far from mean. It's how people make them. They were kitchen dogs. They were bathroom dogs. They were bedroom dogs. They were everywhere you want. This 130 pound dog, boom, right behind, oh, excuse me, I'm trying to cook here, you know, right behind you. You'd move to get the sink and they'd get up from the stove and lay behind you. Like, we just went three feet. Just Stay right where you're at. And you're trying to step around. You know, you're doing this number and you're, oh, oh, oh. but there's the dog right there. We would go change the baby's diapers. We had them when we, the kids were born. We would go from the living room, take the girls in and change. There's the dog right beside the chair. It's like, really? We're just leaving. And if you didn't latch the bathroom, hello. Shower door comes open. There we, hi, water, anybody? It was like, really? What was that Trust. This is the thing is when you build a trust with a person, an animal, it is unbreakable. Amen. However, with humans, we have a short leash. With animals, that trust lives on. It really does. Humans, you mess me once and you're done. It's that guarded heart. I've been there. We've all been there. We've been hurt enough to where I only allow one hurt per person. As I was thinking about this the other day, how many times have I hurt my Lord? Man, his heart must be bruised from me. And yet, as a prodigal son, I did so many things that was anti-Christian, anti-God, anti-things. And yet, on November 21st, 2003, he's still waiting. He was still waiting for me with open arms to come. I've made a debacle of being a senior pastor, a father, a Christian in many ways. And God's just like, I forgive you. You know, it just, and yet I still struggle in one word, trust. We all do. But I, I'm going to preach about me this morning. Because that's all I know. I don't know you. I know me very well. But I struggle with trust. From moments where God says, I'm changing your direction. Why? That direction was going great. Why turn? You know, it's like driving through the country and your GPS is off. And you're like, I wonder what that road has. 
I don't want to get off the beaten route. That might be this and this and this. You go down and go, man, I got to drive down this road again. This was beautiful. We look at God and say, God, that's not where I'm supposed to go. I'm going to go here. God says, I have a detour for you. And it's going to be more beautiful than you can imagine. We're like, no, Lord, I like, I like main roads. You know, they're, they're comfortable. I know that if I keep going north, I'm going to hit a town. But if you take this dirt road off here, I'm not sure where I'm going to go. God says, there's a place I want you to go see. At the end of this road, it's a beautiful lake. And I want you to see my creation. I want to see what I've got planned. Despite all that God does for us, we still reject His plan. We can begin to imagine how God must feel when we don't trust Him. Despite His faithfulness to His promises, His never-changing character, I still struggle with the idea that God is completely trustworthy. It's every one of us. It's that doubt that's in our mind. We, we, Lord, I know you can do it. And in that prayer, there's a little tiny word that goes, but. <laughs> you know, we're praying, it's like, but. <laughs> no buts about it. God has never let me down or you down. Amen. And he never will. Amen. And this is where we got to get the buts out there. It's like I see them all the all the time, but I've heard this terminology, we got to get rid of the stinking thinking. You know, get it out. It's nothing but dangerous to us. That's where the devil loves to pop in there and goes, but no, there is no buts in God. There is wonderful things he has. Even through the midst of the trial, David says after 40 years on the throne of Israel after 10 to 15 years of being this vagrant according to his society, being this outcast, being this castaway, he says his mercies are great. The Lord is gracious. All thy works shall praise thee. They shall speak of their glory to make known the sons of men his mighty acts and the glorious majesty of his kingdom. The Lord is nigh unto all them that call upon him. He knew every step of the way God was there to hear his prayer. Maybe when we feel like we've experienced unanswered prayers or tragedies when they felt God should have spared them from. You know, years ago that used to bother me, but now it's just like God allowed me to go through because he trusts me. God allows me to go through it because He loves me. God allows me to go through some things because He's got to teach me something. It's not because He's being mean. It's not because He didn't answer my prayer. Maybe the unanswered prayer is an answered prayer because maybe, well not maybe, He knew that what I was praying for was not right for me. So that unanswered prayer of mine was actually an answered prayer to my benefit. I was laughing with my dad the other day and we were talking about some things. I said, yeah, if God answered all my prayers, I'd be in a mess. He's like, yep, we all would. You know, if all of my prayers were answered according to my will, <laughs> that wouldn't have been good because God's got a plan. I don't know what it is, but that's where trust and faith in his faithfulness matters. You think about this. Maybe we have the wrong perception of God. Whatever the reasons, the Bible repeatedly stresses that God is completely trustworthy and faithful. Scripture is a picture of a loving, patient, merciful God who will stop at nothing to have a relationship with the people he created. He wants that relationship. If it wasn't so, he wouldn't have left us the parable, the prodigal son. The father did not stop looking. And the father didn't go, okay, let's see how well he wants to come home. I'm going to stand right here and wait for him. No, it said, while he saw his son afar, he ran to him. 
He didn't wait for him to get even halfway before he's like, he's coming home and I got to hug his neck. That's my God. That's when I sat down that week after getting back from Ecuador, I sat down with a good friend of mine and says, I don't think God really worked in my heart because how could God take a person like me and what I've done? How could I be saved to do what I did and God to actually call me into the ministry? You know what Bible verse I try to throw out my friend? The pastor should be blameless. I said, I am not blameless. This is the list. You know what really unnerved me? He never said a word. He did like all of us should do. He opened up God's word, turned to Hebrews, and he says, read this verse. And he says, and answer me the question when you read the verse. Whom he loveth, he chasteneth betimes. You know what stuck out to me? If we're not chastened, I'm a bastard, the Bible says, not a son. I'm an illegitimate child. That hit me right there. I know I'd been through a lot of accidents. And he goes, how many car accidents have you been? Five? He goes, um, didn't you lose your job and lose your house? Yep. Didn't you lose a child? Yep. Weren't you in a tractor trailer accident and walk out of it? Yep. I think he loves you very much. Either that or you're very dense. <laughs> You know, and I looked at that and said, in 10 years, I went through all that. He says, he's not asking you if you're blameless. He's asking you if you're willing. Mm -hmm. And you know, that's the thing is, I wanted to bring up my past, and God says, what past? Amen. You know, the devil wants to say, I'm not qualified. But isn't it God's job to qualify the cult? Amen. And this is where... I had to trust him that he knew, he knows my frame. He knows the sin of my past. He knows my inconsistency. He knows my unbelief. And he says, I can use you. Learning to trust God is to realize that his love covers the multitude of sin. And this is where I had to realize he is a radical God. Because only a radical person would ever love someone so messed up as me. There is nothing he will do. Is, excuse me, there is nothing he will not do to bring me back to him. My God wants each and every one of his children to be just as radically involved as he is. You know, the world's taking that term and says, that means a nut job, crazy. No, it doesn't. It means you're sold out. Nothing's going to stop you. Growing in trust toward God, we must have four things this morning. First of all, we must have knowledge of Him. In order to trust Him, you've got to know Him. Knowing Him, and the more we know Him, the more amazing it gets. Psalms 145, I've read enough. I will extol thee, my God, O King. I will bless thy name forever and ever. Why did David say that? Because he knew him. Read the book of Psalms and you'll see he had doubts about his God. He even went like this at God several times. He even says, God, kill me. I'm done. But through it all, he says, God, why have you forsaken me? Psalms 13 was one of his down and out psalms. He accused God of forsaking him. And you know what the last part of the chapter says? You haven't. God had to give him a uh-oh moment to where, yeah, that's just me and my pity party. I'm in the cave. Saul's outside with his army. I'm cornered like a rabbit. There's nothing I could do. God, you've left me, deserted me. You haven't loved me. And yet he says, God, you love me. I guarantee you every one of us sitting in this room has had those dark moments where we've looked at our mirror and says, God, are you, do you even care? Are you even here? I've been there. Sadly, more times than one. 
But let me tell you, God does care. God has put me through some hard times. Times I wouldn't signed up for. But He does it because He loves me. And you know, I look at life and one of the verses that I've quoted over and over from this pulpit, and I'll quote it to the day I die, be still and know that I am God. That verse was given to me in the darkest part of my life. And I've had to sit down and say, God, I've just got to be still and know that you're on the throne. You haven't left me. But that trust has to let go. You know, every time things have come around in my life, in the ministry, personal life, changes, I have to realize God's in control. From the final moments of my life, I want to rest like David does and say his name was worthy to be praised forever and ever. As my grandfather took his last breath on this earth in February 14th, what a day to graduate to heaven. 1981, he told his sons and daughters when they asked him, do you regret anything that God's allowed you to go through? Losing two children at the age of two and three, burying them in suitcases, having three children in a prison war camp, going through malaria, going through all that you did in 57 years of ministry in China. You know what he said? Trust and obey for there's no other way. There is no other way. Trust and obey for there's no other way. I, I can't imagine being a father and putting your son in a suitcase in an unmarked grave. I can't imagine putting your daughter a few years later and burying her in the middle of the night. But I can't imagine carrying her lifeless body for over 24 hours and pretending she's alive. I can't imagine getting the news that your three children in boarding school are now in a Japanese concentration camp. I can't imagine what that's like. But he says, trust and obey, for there's no other way. When I look around and I, and I see what little I've been through, and I'm like, and I cry about that, Considering what Christians are going through in this world today, what have we really gone through? You know, I look around and I say, I know I have to be still and know the God. The truth is you cannot trust someone you don't know. So getting to know Him is the key to learning how to trust Him. As we walk in communion with Him, we learn that He has our best interests at heart, our best plan, our best way. Even when He doesn't answer our prayer on our schedule or says no to a prayer or changes our direction of life, He's doing that because He is our Alpha and Omega. He knows the beginning and the end. He knows what I need. I may not. I may not want to know. But God has a plan. And that has led me to the second one which is hard for every one of us. In trusting God, we must let go of doubts. It's human to doubt. We always have that fraction of a doubt in anywhere in our mind, especially when it comes to people. You know, it's, I don't know why it is so prevalent, but throughout the Bible, he talks about unbelief. You know what it basically is? Unbelief is, I doubt you can do it. I don't think you can. And when we pray sometimes, like I said, I'm praying and all of a sudden into my mind just pops this, but what if? No, there's no what ifs in God's book. A lot of times, one of my favorite choir songs I sang at Crossroads Baptist Church when I was in Bible school was Here Comes Jesus Right on Time. You know, every time Joyce would sing that song, it would just hit right here. Because the thing was, Jesus never does things on my time. Never. Ever, 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 ever. Lazarus is dead. And they said, he stinketh. <laughs> he's in the grave. You tarried, and because you tarried, he's in the grave and dead. But I'm glad he tarried. 
Mary and Martha did not understand why he tarried. We sent for you three days ago when he was still alive, and you could have not let him die. If we would have done, we wouldn't have had a verse that God had humanity. The shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus wept. That wept was not the Greek word that he went, <laughs> okay, let's get back to miracles. He wept. Lazarus was his friend. But you know what? We also wouldn't have the verse, I am the resurrection and the life. That gives me and you hope that death is not the final. Amen. Oh, death, where is thy sting? Grave, where is thy victory? So when I say goodbye, when I do a funeral for my church members, or you may do a funeral for me, it's not goodbye, it's good night. Because as a child of God, it's just a short time, shorter for me than you, <laughs> or shorter for you than me, whoever goes first. And it's blink of an eye, we're going to be back together forever and ever and ever as a child of God. Because of his waiting, he was able to bring him back to life, to die again, physically, but not spiritually. The unbelief, because you tarried, Lord, here comes Jesus down the road right on time, the song says. That's how it's been with God. The house we currently live in, it came in the last month. Little did I know we were going to move up the road. Ever since we got the notice that he's selling the house, we've been looking since April to no avail. I know Jesus is going to come down the road sometime on his time. I don't like cutting it close. I like very organized. I like this and I like this. You know, when my plane says it leaves at 8 o'clock, I want it to leave at 8 o'clock. Not 9, 10, 11, and well, the mechanic's not here yet. But there's a reason. But you think, we, we have, you know, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. Sometimes God's like, stop the clock. Really, Lord? But that's God's plan. I hated timeouts as a goalie. I really did. Because as a goalie, you get used to being in a position. And when you stand up, you're like, oh, what am I doing down that position? And, you know, and then you sit there and you just kind of skate around. You're trying to keep warm. Or you walk around. You try to do this. And then the timeout is just killing time. It's not really about anything in hockey but killing time. I don't like killing time. Let's get the game over. We're winning and we're losing. Let's do better. Let's stop killing time and stopping the clock. It's not going to change it any. If we're going to lose, we're going to lose. There's no way we're going to get three points back in 25 minutes. Not unless somebody's really good. But the thing is, God has a point of going, you haven't learned your lesson yet. I have some teaching points. I've got some things that unbelief to eradicate if you're having trouble trusting in God and His character and His goodness, one of the things you ought to do is tell Him. You know, David, I love the Psalms. He told God a lot, Lord, I, I just don't believe it. Lord, I, I just, I don't know, I don't see you. Why is your hand heavy against me? Why is this? Talk to God. You don't think He already knows what you're thinking? <laughs> You don't think he already knows what you're feeling? You may not say it. You may be able to fool your spouse, your mother, your father, your friends around you, but you cannot fool God because he knows I'm already grumbling inside. He already knows I'm not happy. When my landlord said he was going to sell his house, you know what I thought? Really? Here we go again. i am be honest. That was my thought. That was my first thought. Here we go again. And you know what I said? I just want to be settled. I, I just want to be settled. I don't want to move anymore. I'm now 51. <laughs> it doesn't get easier when I get older. It gets harder. But the more, the older I get, the more I just want that forever place. I, I want, I, I'm a person now, home is my favorite place. I, I just want to be home. And what does God do? I'm going to do this for you. 
And my wife goes, great. Now he's only called me 25 times a day because he's not home. You know, I want to be home. I want to be in my place where I'm comfortable. And God's like, nope. I got a new journey for you. Okay. And you know what the Bible says in Mark chapter 6, verse 6, and he marveled because of their unbelief. And he went around about villages teaching. God doesn't want me to have unbelief, but just trust in him that he's got a plan for me. I don't understand it, but it's not for me to understand, but to trust. Mark chapter 9, verse 24, and straightway the father of the child cried out, and said in tears, I believe, help thou my unbelief. You know, he turns to Jesus and he goes, I know you can heal from a distance, but why don't you come to my house and do it? And Jesus speaks to him and the father realizes, help me with my unbelief. Jesus does not have to be here in front of us to work a miracle. He is everywhere. He doesn't have to be holding our hands to reassure us that he's got it. Mark chapter 16, verse 14, Afterward he appeared unto the leaven as they sat at meat and unbraided them for their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they believed not them which had seen him after he is risen. You know what they told Mary? You saw a ghost. Mary Magdalene did not see a ghost. She knows it because she says, Rabbi, Master. She had seen and heard her Master's voice. And the disciple says, yeah, right. And you know what Jesus did? Comes right in that room, doors locked, they're done like cowards. Comes right in the middle and goes, shame on you guys for chiding Mary Magdalene for not, you know, what were you guys thinking? Romans chapter 3 verse 3 says, For what if some do not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? Our unbelief is not going to change who God is. Our unbelief is not going to change the fact that He is faithful. Yeah. Our unbelief is not going to change the Bible verse that says, I change not. I am the same yesterday, today, and the tomorrow. Romans 4.20 says, He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. Abraham, why does God put these little verses in here? To remind us that Abraham, at the age of 70s, God told him, I want you to move to a land that I will tell you. Do what? Honey, we're packing. Where are we going? I don't know. That feels like very familiar. <laughs> We're packing. Where are we going? I don't know. We're, we're packing. What are we going to do with our stuff? I don't know. I was laughing with a friend of mine. He goes, well, he goes, um, so the animal's going to be with you in church? I said, probably. <laughs> <laughs> and I says, uh, nope. You know, the thing is, I don't know. But he staggered not at God's promise. I'm going to show you a place. But guess what faith takes? Faith and one other F word, feet. We got to, in order for Peter to walk on water, he had to get what? Step out. In order for many of the men to do the miracles, they had to perform it. You know, you think about Elisha. He did seven more times miracles than Elijah did. Think about all that we have to do. God wants feet to our faith and prayers. Amen. You know, if you want to pray for rain, bring an umbrella. Don't pray for rain and don't bring an umbrella because you're saying you're not going to believe God's going to do it. But he staggered not at the promises of God. Don't, don't stumble. That's what it means. God is trustworthy. The Jews staggered 
The Bible says, because of their unbelief, they were broken off, and thou standest by faith, be not high-minded, but fear. He's looking at the Gentiles, he goes, they lost their position because of their unbelief. Don't you stagger at it. We don't understand. If God was accepted by the Jews, would the Gentiles got the gospel? Probably not. But guess what? That was all in God's plan. But they, do you know what the Bible says? We were grafted in. I love my granddad on my dad's side. He was very much of a horticulturist and he loved his pear trees and apple trees. His place in Mavinda, Oregon was just a massive driveway of a fruit vineyard. Just as far as you could see, trees. He liked pears, but he liked unusual pears. Don't even know the name of them. He just called them concoction. But you know, he was proud of some of his pears because he would cut V shapes and then and tape it and that. And all of a sudden, Bradford pear would have this kind of pear and that pear, and then he'd mix them there, and it was like, it was absolutely delicious. He had pears that had Macintosh and Red Delicious, or apples that had Macintosh and Red Delicious on the same tree. He would just graft them in. It's amazing. He'd just tinker over there, had a big old buck pocket knife, and he'd be whittling, he goes, I'm making a graft. It's like, how did that ever work? Don't know, but it does. And then right where that tree is, there's a knot where it healed around itself. And boy, lovely fruit. But that's what he did. But that's what our Lord's done. He's taken the Gentile tree, grafted it in history. Right with the Jews, right with the barbarians, right with the free, right with the bond. God says, you all are part of my tree. I am the vine. Ye are the vineyard. Take heed, brethren, lest, by, lest there be any of you of an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Thirdly, we must have faith in His faithfulness. There are so many verses, but I want to turn to you to one in Psalms 33 and verse 4. Psalms 33 and verse 4. David says, For the word of the Lord is right. And all his works are done in truth. The word of the Lord is right. And all his works are done in truth. God does it right all the time. Psalms 100 verse 5. For the Lord is good, His mercy is everlasting, and His truth endureth to all generations. God will not lie. Malachi 3, 5, or 3, 6. The very last prophet to minister before the coming of the Lord writes this. For I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. I am the Lord, I change not. Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 12 and verse 22. 1 Samuel chapter 12 and verse 22. For the Lord will not forsake His people, for his great name's sake, because it had pleased the Lord to make you his people. What a verse. Back in verse 16, when I came to Community Baptist Church in 2006, there were a lot of things going on I could honestly say I didn't sign up for. And you know, one day I was preparing for a men's meeting And I was really struggling to whether I should continue on or say, I'm out. 
just because there was a lot of things I didn't really think I could handle. And God gave me this verse, and I've underlined it in every Bible that I have, in 1 Samuel chapter 12, verse 16. Now therefore stand and see the great thing which the Lord will do before your eyes. I can honestly say from 2006 to 2023, I've seen God do some awesome stuff. Has it been an easy road? By far from it. But God has been faithful. And that is having faith in His faithfulness. When God said to my wife and I, we're here for such a time as this, He knew exactly the good and the bad roads. He knew the people. He knew the future. He knew my health. He knew my finances. He knew everything. And when He calls you, the Bible says His callings is without repentance. I may not understand it. I may not like it. But when I stop and think, it was what I needed. Second Samuel, or, or chapter 15, 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 29. And also the strength of Israel will not lie nor repent, for he is not a man that he should repent. The strength of Israel will not lie nor repent. He's our strength, folks. And through that we can have faith that he is not a liar and he will not change his mind halfway through. Oh, I made a bad decision. God will never do that. But one thing I've realized and in closing this morning, if I have knowledge of him, then I know I can trust him. If I have knowledge of him, I know that my unbelief is unfounded. If I have faith in his faithfulness and I trust him and I have no unbelief, then I can have peace that passes all understanding. Trust brings. When I think about one of the common things that I have uncovered, not really uncovered, but the common thread in a lot of my marriage counseling over the years has been, I don't trust her. I don't trust him. When they leave for work, I don't trust them. That is one thing my wife and I, we have never experienced. I've traveled a lot in my marriage. She never has to worry about, and I don't have to worry about, well, what am I going to find when I get home? That's never a part of my vocabulary because I trust her. When I said, till death do us part, to be faithful in sickness and health, that's exactly what I meant. There's not an issue. It's not, but the problem is, I know a lot of people that struggle with that. My husband's gone for more than three hours. He must be up to something bad. No, there's traffic. There's delays. There's this. There's that. There's all of us have done a job that's supposed to be this long and it turns out to be this long and we're like, that wasn't signed up for her. But you know, we got to have that trust. We've all been in churches that have hurt us. We got to have that trust. Because if God's in it, then we could trust him that he brought us to where he brought us that spouse. He brought us this. God makes no mistakes. If we do these things, we'll have peace. The greatest verse for that is found in Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. And verse 6 through 8, the Bible says, And the peace of God which passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Where's the greatest tool that causes doubt? Our mind. We overthink and over-rationalize and over everything else. And sometimes we need to have that childlike faith and just get to the edge of the step and jump. You know, and dad's going to catch you, I promise you. 
Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me, do, and the God of peace shall be with you. If we do these things, and we have the right thinking that God is not being mean, that God is being a Father that knows all. He knows our path. After a while, you can feel a horse when he's relaxed. If not, it feels like a rubber band and you're going to go for a ride. You can see their withers, you can flank is just tight. And when they're relaxed, their head's down. You ever see trail horses with their head down? They know their path. They're faithful with it. But if their head's up and they're perked and they're looking around like this and their ears are flat back, you're going to go for a ride. <laughs> you're going to go for a ride. But if their head's down and you hardly have a hold on the reins and they're just meandering, you can relax because the horse is in relax and trust in you. I love riding Coley because her head was always down and she just plodded. But if there was a stick... Or if there was a rock, boy, she got excited. That's going to be a snake down there. But after you're talking to her, that's just a stick, girl. Okay. It's just a stick. And other horses, it's a puddle. There's a shark in there. And I know it is. <laughs> it's going to eat the horse. Lori's horse will go 55 miles out of the way not to step in a puddle. Literally. If there's not a way in the forest, it will make a way in the forest with Lori on the back of it. Because there's a puddle, and there's a shark-eating horse in there, I promise you. <laughs> but that, you know what? He hasn't learned to completely trust. Lori's not going to take him through somewhere. If Sabrina is leading Banner through the puddle, he's fine. But she has to get wet first. <laughs> but you know, you look at you laugh, and we have a hilariousness joke about our horses and mine. But Lord, I'm not going ahead until you lead me. And that's not always what God wants. God wants to step out in faith. But Lord, I'm not going to step out until I know you're ahead of me. Sometimes God says, I want you to step out regardless. Like he did Abraham. I want you to step out. I will show you. Didn't tell him where the city was. But walk until I tell you to stop. That's hard to do especially for a guy, because I like to know where my GPS is leading me. I like to know that end route. But sometimes God says, trust me, you'll like the end. But you got to trust me. Our prayer ought to be, Lord, I sometimes have trouble trusting you. Give me the courage to trust you 100% of the time. Show me my flaws. Help me correct my flaws. And help me not have unbelief. May we be the prayer of that man. Forgive me of my unbelief. Trust of God should be already earned. He's never let us down. And he will never, ever let us down. It's me who has broke my Savior's heart time and time again. But his trust, he still trusts me. That's what blows my mind. He still wants to bless me. He still wants to lead me. He still wants to be my father. That I'm so undeserving. That's because he is so loving. May God help us. In closing, I want to give you the verse that is on the screen in whole perspective because in love in verse 7 the Bible says charity beareth all things believeth all things hopeth all things endureth all things charity never faileth Think about that. Love always trust. 
beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. There's no mistake when the Holy Spirit had Paul pin that. Love always trusts God in everything. Because charity, His love for us will never fail. For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That is what we ought to take to the bank. God's love will never fail for mankind, and especially for His children. May God help us this morning to always learn to trust God in every circumstance. Heavenly Father, Lord, forgive us for not trusting you in everything. For not trusting you for your perfect plan even when we do not see the end. For we know that you will always, always lead us correctly. Lord, I ask you that you just continue to work in my heart and our heart as your church, as your believers, that we will always put our faith and trust in you without any buts or maybes, but that complete trust to where we know that your plan is perfectly molded for my life. And it is a way for me to grow deeper in love with you. For you have loved me so much. May I reciprocate that love to you. Lord, I ask you to dismiss with your blessing. Be with the final minutes of this service. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Thank you so much for being here this morning. May the Lord bless you. And may you have a good afternoon. See you tonight at 4.30 and um, for prayer and 5 o'clock for evening worship. You're dismissed.